Dan, I, like you, have been fascinated with consciousness my whole life. It seems like it's a window on some bigger reality beyond us. You've talked about consciousness as something that we feel that's really more marvelous than it really is. Why is that? Yes, I think that consciousness plays tricks on us. Um, it seems to us as if here we are inside, somewhere behind the eyes and in between the ears, <laughs> and uh, the inner witness is watching this wonderful show, and it's, it's all in color, and it's complete in some wonderful sense. But then when you do the... The, the physiology and you study perception, you realize that no, in fact, you have a very limited take. You're only taking sips from that fire hose of information that's coming in, a little bit from vision, a little bit from, from hearing. And there's in fact this, this competition going on, tug of war between different senses, between different interpretations of what you're seeing. And all of this competition resolves itself in the fullness of time and pretty darn quick uh, to produce the, the behavior that we're capable of and the reflection that we're capable of. It seems, though, as if there's, it all comes together at some place for, for enjoyment in the middle. And that's just an illusion. There's no place in the brain where it all comes together for enjoyment and for, and for witnessing by an inner witness. We have this sense of unity, yeah. though. I have a sense that everything is all together, that I have a unified sense of consciousness. And that sense is, is largely illusory. We're nowhere near as unified as we think we are. Mm -hmm. The reason it seems so unified is we can't see, we can't see the joints. Uh, you, you can't see a boundary unless you can see both sides of it. Notice it takes, it takes some special tricks to see your own blind spot. Mm -hmm. I mean, mostly we don't realize how, uh, how little we're actually taking in from our from our various senses. Uh, it takes clever experiments to expose these these gaps and fissures. Uh, Take vision, for example. Yeah. How does that how does that work in vision? Well, your eye has a high resolution central area called the fovea, and it's actually very small. Mm. Uh, it's what you can see if you look at your thumbnail at arm's length, which is which is. Uh, it's just a Very tiny little little part of the visual target field, of yeah. the visual field. Yeah. That's the only thing that's detailed enough, for instance, to 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 recognize a face or or wow. tell what a word is to read. <laughs> and we move that fixation point around uh, very fast, three or four times a second. And what happens to those high resolution bits? Are they mounted somewhere on an inner screen and then <coughs> extrapolated in between? No, really, they're not. They're, uh, some information is kept on hand, but mainly we let the world store its own information okay. and, and just go and sip a little bit here and a little bit there when we need it. Now, that process, that's not what it feels like, uh, but that's what's happening. <laughs> And once we understand that vision works that way, we can begin to understand that all of our senses are much patchier, much more restrictive in the bits that, as one says, come to consciousness. But even that idea of coming to consciousness is, I think, a bit illusory because it suggests there's this threshold and there's things that are on their way to consciousness that haven't quite reached there, and then finally, shazam, they burst into consciousness. Now they're part of the inner show. There are some phenomena that are mm, sort of like that, but I think this is a misleading way of thinking yeah. about it. You've talked about a, a center of narrative gravity, and that, I, yeah. I guess, gives us this sense of continuity of some kind. Yeah, I think that only human beings with language have a center of narrative gravity. And the reason for that is that we're always sort of presenting ourselves we're, the narrative, the autobiography, this is me, <laughs> this is who I am. Um, I coined the idea uh, on, a, on an analogy to the center of gravity. Yeah. Uh, now, every object of any mass attracts every other object uh, and all parts attract every other part. But it's very convenient to simplify and to say, well, the moon is attracted to the earth and there are these two points, the center of gravity of the moon, the center of gravity of the earth. And, and we, can, we can calculate all the forces right. between these two imaginary points. Yeah. And so this is a huge oversimplification yeah. of the physics, but it works, it works. beautifully. Right. So 
And, and it works in the mundane, everyday world, too. Sit down, you're rocking the boat. The center of gravity of this, right. of this boat is too high. If you sit down, now the center of gravity is lower. Now it's much more stable. We have an intuitive grasp. You can almost feel the center of gravity, but it's just a mathematical point. Yeah. Similarly, you could swear that you could just almost feel this self, this right. Inner point where where it all comes together, but there's no. It's just a. It's just a, an abstraction. It's a very useful abstraction. If we couldn't consider each other as having this center of narrative gravity, we'd be baffled. The center of narrative gravity. That's that's the author of your of your words. It's the sufferer of your pains. It's the. It's what I love. If I love you, uh, it's it, it's the the coat rack on which we hang all the important things, but it's just an abstraction. Look, the, the critical junction comes when we talk about the, the, the experience, the phenomenology, what philosophers like to call, philosophers except you, I think, qualia. Yeah. This, this sense of, that we can, we can talk about all the specific aspects of vision or of hearing and dissect that and brain parts are doing this and that, but when it gets to the, the experience of what it really means to feel that, that that's the so-called hard problem yeah. that you can't get around. Well, <laughs> notice that the qualia only makes sense if you've got a, an inner witness in the Cartesian theater. If you've, because what if what if your what if your um, what if your automobile had qualia running around and said, well, there'd be, there'd be nobody to enjoy them. <laughs> As it, there's nobody home inside there, so there's nobody to enjoy them. Qualia are uh, uh, sort of by definition, they're the things that make life worth living. They're the, they're the qualities that you, not your brain, that yeah. you enjoy. <laughs> well, if we decide that that you is a sort of theorist fiction, then we've sort of orphaned the qualia too. And we have to understand that that very enjoyment or suffering has to be parceled out too. That has to be broken down, deconstructed into, into dispositional properties and various complex states of parts of your brain and body that aren't themselves conscious. And that's amazingly, that's the difference between a, a, a beautiful note that is perfectly in tune and a slightly flat right, note right. That, mm, yeah. you hate it. All right, now. But, but I can uh, feel to, both. You, can, I can, you feel. can feel both. But now we have to take that, that hating of the off yeah. note, the, the, the flat note. Let's just take that as an example. All right, now, part of this is easy. Uh, the, 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 the acoustic wave hits your ears and it's, it's of the wrong frequency. It should be yeah. several, uh, 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 beat faster. Uh, so, uh, your brain detects that and that sets up, uh, a, a series, a wave of actions in your brain that are responding to this flat note. And now rushing ahead, we get to the outside world, and what happens? You go, eh, all right, now that's behavior. Uh, but then in addition to the, to the visible winds, right, right. there's a flood of other things going on. There's, oh, I'm not going to hire this clarinetist. <laughs> and uh, do you suppose that was on purpose? Maybe this is a quarter tone. Maybe <laughs> this is you know, some <laughs> Middle Eastern music that uses a different scale. There's, who knows? all of the things that the perception of that note could engender. Yes. Uh, take them all together, and that's what qualia are. But there's no extra property, which is the well, awfulness of that flat note, which, which, which has to be accounted for. It has been accounted for in this sum of all of these reactions. I, I guess the critical question is, is, is the sum of everything the totality, or is there something extra? And the extra seems to be that I, 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 I feel it. All of the other pieces of the sum could exist without my feeling it. 
that's well, the that's, question. <laughs> that's an illusion, I think. Yeah. <laughs> I, and and, and it's, a, it's a fairly straightforward illusion. It's, it, it's an error of subtraction. <laughs> you've got that big sum, and you subtract, and you subtract, and you subtract, and you subtract, and you say, well, I've done all the subtraction, there's something left over. Yeah. No, you've, you've inadvertently subtracted it all away, and, and you just don't realize that, <laughs> that, that you've, actually, you've actually covered it all.